Kansas City Peace Building Conference uh, 2020. Um, and this is uh, three months of peace. So uh, at least in our sector of the world, uh, we will enjoy this. Uh, my name's Louis Duguid, formerly with the Kansas City Star, um, and now um, the Political Action uh, Committee Chair for the National Association for Multicultural Education. Um, we're going to begin uh, this kickoff session with Professor Steve Youngblood, uh, Director of the Center for uh, Global Peace Journalism at Park University. Uh, he's going to talk with us about uh, partisan media narratives impeding social justice. I want to uh, first say, though, that uh, this type of discussion is uh, so incredibly important now as we witnessed um, the uh, continued killings of African Americans uh, who are unarmed uh, by police, um, and of course the division and unrest that are being sowed by the uh, people um, in Washington. So uh, Steve, why don't you go ahead and lead us off. Um, those individuals who um, have questions or comments, please go ahead and put it into the chat. Um, and um, we'll leave time at the end for uh, Steve to answer questions and uh, take on discussions. Thank you very much, Lewis, and uh, welcome to uh, everyone out there. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you and to spend a few minutes with you uh, this afternoon. As Lewis mentioned, my name is Stephen Youngblood. I'm director of the Center for Global Peace Journalism at Park University, where I'm also a um, communications and peace studies professor. Uh, in my capacity as director of the Center for Global Peace Journalism, I've had the opportunity to teach uh, in 27 countries around the world, um, working with journalists and academics and students uh, on the idea that uh, journalism can be better. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, peace journalism uh, today. So today we're going to look at, uh, as we sort of break down the subject matter, uh, partisan protest coverage, first of all, uh, then the, the, the coverage is the impact of this coverage on uh, social justice and then finally, what I consider to be a solution, a way to improve the coverage uh, by using uh, peace journalism. Now, uh, as you generate questions during, uh, during my presentation, please put them in the chat. And Lewis has uh, uh, generously agreed to moderate those questions. And uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, I promise to leave plenty of time to answer your questions and to get us into a little uh, back and forth. So, you know, like seemingly everything else, um, well, like COVID and seemingly everything else, coverage of the recent Black Lives Matter George Floyd protests uh, varies a great deal depending on what, what media outlet one is consuming. Uh, let's begin by looking at an overview of how partisanship is reflected in the coverage. Now, these are my observations first and foremost, uh, although there is data to back, back up these conclusions. So we're going to look at several of these in depth, but look at the different ways that conservative and liberal media uh, have, for example, covered the violence. Conservative media have emphasized riots and looting. Uh, there's been less emphasis of that in liberal media and more of the peaceful protests. Conservative media showing police as a few bad apples causing the violence. Uh, liberal media talking about systemic racism. Um, Antifa, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, the president's Bible photo, photo op uh, was either a strength to show what a, what a wonderfully religious man he is, or it was despicable uh, in that it unleashed government troops against protesters. Uh, looking, at, looking at cities, uh, Seattle, Portland, and so on, um, the con Fox News and the conservative media would tell you that it's lawlessness, inept democratic mayors, uh, letting the protesters run amok and so on. Uh, and you get an opposite view in the liberal media. And then this idea about defunding police in conservative media, they're talking about it liberally, literally, well, liberally too, but literally, uh, that they're talking about how those on the left want to eliminate all police 
Uh, and then, then, of course, the chaos that would ensue. Uh, on the left, uh, it's more of a discussion of defunding as a means of rethinking policing and reallocating uh, some of that, um, some of those police funds. So let's di dive a little deeper on a couple of these. And the first thing I'd like to look at is the way that violence is depicted. And by this, I mean both the words and the images that are used to describe the events. Is the violence emphasized or is it downplayed? As you might guess, the answer depends on the political leanings of the media outlet. Now, in a few moments, we'll be discussing words because words matter. They carry meanings beyond their dictionary definitions and help news consumers contextualize the news. So the study on your screen is by an organization called GDELT. It was published in the Washington Post, and it showed that Fox stories used the term riots or rioters five times more than CNN. And Fox reports discussed looting, discussed looting 25% more, more than CNN. So based just on the language, this means that Fox viewers are more likely to embrace a violent and riot narrative versus consumers of CNN and other media, which might be more open to different interpretations of the unrest. So the same partisan narrative Hang on, I got, I stumbled here. Let's see, hang on, hang on. Current slide, where is it? There we go. So the same partisan narrative can be seen in the way that newspapers cover the protests. So the pictures and headlines used in newspapers matter because they shape the way news consumers perceive the unrest. A small survey of newspaper front pages on June the 2nd showed that a number of newspapers used images that reflected the 99% of peaceful protesters, rather than taking the bait of using sensational images that misrepresented reality. Aside from the Kansas City Star and Minneapolis Star Tribune, which are pictured, um, those that I'd consider responsible front pages, including the Washington Post, with the headline, US at Precipice as Demonstrations Intensify, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution headline, Another Day of Unease. The New York Times, Twin crisis and Crises and Surging Anger Convulse U.S. And the Fort Worth Star-Telegraph, Area Protests Against Police Brutality Continue for a Third Day. Unfortunately, others like the Chicago Tribune and New York Post, along with the Arizona Republic, the LA Times, and Miami Herald, Choice chose to highlight the looting and violence while marginalizing the peaceful protesters and the underlying reasons for their protests. Uh, I think what's especially interesting is this New York Post front page. Uh, the, the gentleman standing there seems awful Satan-like to me. I wonder if that was the impression they were trying to create. So, as the opening slide indicated, I believe conservative media have framed police as heroes unfairly attacked and that a few bad apples ruined the reputation of all police. <clears throat> a standing banner on Breitbart.com, for example, is titled The War on Police. More liberal media have tended to attribute this un unrest to systemic racism in the police while not being shy in po pointing out police misconduct during the protests. In June, I conducted a small study of four newspapers, two liberal, two conservative, between May 25th and June 2nd. I used their own websites and Nexus Uni to generate data on the use of the term police brutality. As the chart indicates, the term police brutality was used much more in liberal media, 181 times in the New York Times and 111 times on the Washington Post blogs compared to just 12 hits on WashingtonTimes.com and 27 in the Wall Street Journal. 
In the same study, I looked at the term police systemic racism and came up with similar results. There were a total of 70 mentions of this combined on the Washington Post blogs and New York Times, while there were only 13 combined mentions of systemic racisms during the same time period in the Wall Street Journal and Washington Times. Finally, one can see partisan partisanship reflected in partisan media coverage of Antifa. One characteristic of irresponsible partisan media is how they employ us versus them and good guy versus bad guy frames. So in right-wing media, the ultimate bad guy, a boogeyman, if you will, is Antifa. So Antifa is a tiny fascist protest movement. I'm sorry, it's a tiny anti-fascist protest movement that is characterized in the press as too loosely constituted to even be called an organization. They've sometimes had violent encounters with right-wingers and neo-Nazis. Antifa is Fox News' favorite boogeyman. A study shows that from May 27th to June 10th, Fox News programs mentioned Antifa more than 325 times. Fox Business, 173 times. And uh, while at the same time, Antifa showed up on CNN only 67 times and MSNBC only 88 times. The previously mentioned GDELT study showed that Fox dismissed and I'm sorry, showed that Fox discussed Antifa six times more than CNN during the study period. So Fox has been busy attributing the violence uh, during Black Lives Matter protests to Antifa. Is this the reality? Well, the reality is, is that Antifa poses little or no threat. According to the Washington Post, when Antifa tried to gather nationally, they topped out at only a few hundred attendees. On CNN, historian Mark Brace said, quote, you can see when these groups in major cities mobilize, they don't get more than a couple hundred people. In addition, Antifa had nothing to do with the violence during the recent protests. In June, the FBI found, quote, no evidence that Antifa was involved in violence that erupted during the national protests over the death of George Floyd. Further, Reuters looked at federal charging documents, at federal charging documents related to the protests and found, quote, no violent acts are alleged at all that are attribute, attributed to Antifa. So while we have a lot of noise about Antifa, the fact is there were no links between Antifa and any of the violence uh, that broke out in some places during the protests. So now that we've seen the partisanship and protest coverage uh, in the differences in how violence and Antifa and other things are covered, let's talk about the impact of that, uh, of that coverage on social justice and social justice movements. So we see two main impacts, essentially. First of all, that in general, coverage of this kind portrays protesters negatively. And this then uh, leads to negative impressions about the reasons behind the protests. So research shows that mainstream news organizations have struggled to accurately and fairly portray protests uh, that challenge the political and social status quo. That media attention to protests tends to be negative, stigmatizing protesters as deviant, and depicting protests as violent. Many factors can cause the quality and quantity of journalism narratives to fluctuate, including the intensity of the conflict, the radical nature of protester tactic, tactics, the type of protest, the media outlet, and the proximity of the protests to news organizations. So a second impact of this coverage on social justice is that the agenda tends to get ignored. So according to researcher Danielle Kilgo, the press does not cover movements that do not engage in newsworthy activity. So the more 
violent it is, or the, at least the more visually engaging it is, the more likely it is to get covered. So knowing that the press doesn't cover movements that don't engage in newsworthy activity, the advocates stage events to attract media attention, which they need to distribute the message to broader audiences and to signal their strength. So journalists then cover these staged events without generating substantive information about the event's background or the grievances or agenda of the movement behind the protest. So as media do with so many in so many other subject areas, uh, they do a pretty good job of reporting episodes. So this episodic reporting we can see in crime coverage, terrorism coverage, coverage of protests, coverage of poverty and so on, but we don't do nearly, we're not nearly as effective when it, when it, co when it comes to offering context, to really delving into the reasons behind the protests. So what can be done to improve this coverage, to lessen its negative impact on social justice? In fact, I believe that peace journalism can be used to improve partisan coverage of these protests um, and future unrest as well. Mm -hmm. So with your permission, I'd like to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about this concept of peace journalism. So what is peace journalism? So it's an idea that was first hatched in the 1960s by a Norwegian academic named Dr. Johan Galta. And it was first offered as a response to what Galtung and others saw as, as a negative, uh, unproductive coverage of war and conflict. Now, in the years since the 1960s, uh, the ideas of what peace journalism can be have greatly expanded, uh, offering not just an antidote to poor war coverage, but, in, but offering a better way forward for coverage in lots of different areas of endeavor. So in my book, Peace Journalism and Pra- in my book, Peace Journalism Principles and Practices, I talk about how these principles can apply to covering um, crime, to covering refugees and migrants, uh, to covering race, and yes, to covering civic unrest, as in the situation here. So let me tell you a little bit about peace journalism. By definition, it's when reporters and editors make choices that can create an atmosphere conducive to peace. So what choices am I talking about? So, I'm, so first I'm talking about how we frame stories, how we tell the story. So do we tell the story, um, do we tell the story in a way that is merely sensational, that merely uses inflammatory words, that is merely episodic, or do we frame the story in a different way, a way that provides context? a way that provides a proportionate voice to peace builders, a way that doesn't, at minimum, doesn't take a bad situation and make that situation worse. So I always use the phrase, pouring gasoline on the fire. And I think too frequently, media when covering things like civic unrest and lots of other subjects too, pour gasoline on the fire. Peace journalism seeks to frame stories so that that doesn't happen. Another choice that reporters and editors make is the language that we use. So we know that language is essential in telling stories, in helping people understand the news. So we've already seen the power, as we discuss partisan media, of the word protester versus the word rioter. So those two terms carry very powerful and different meanings. So what peace journalism seeks to do is to look, to examine the language that we use as journalism and to ask, is this language pouring gasoline on the fire? Is this language inflammatory? Is this language accusatory? Is this language demonizing? Does the language 
make angry people angrier? Does the, ang does the language accuse without providing proof? Is the language imprecise and emotive? So traditional journalism might tell us 20 people were brutal, 20 people were brutally slaughtered in a bloodbath. Peace journalism would say 20 people were killed. So the first version I would argue is nothing but sensationalism. It doesn't add any information to the story. It simply pours gasoline on the fire. The second version doesn't leave out any of the facts, but it's more matter of fact. So when I teach peace journalism at various places around the world, we talk about labels that we give people. Uh, the label of rioter versus protester, uh, the label of terrorist. Think about how often we use that term, right? And how very, freak, very, very few of us really understand what that term, use, term means. And the fact that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. So is a 15-year-old boy throwing rocks at Israeli troops on the West Bank, is he a terrorist? The Israelis might say yes. Certainly the Palestinians would tell you no. Uh, in several places that I've taught peace journalism, um, in Lebanon, in Kashmir. So in Kashmir, they use the word martyr frequently in their news media. So if you die fighting the Indian government, you are a martyr. Well, my question to them was, Think about the impact that this word, word has. So isn't it enough to say that someone was killed fighting the Kashmiris, fighting the Indian government? When we use words like martyr, what we're doing is literally elevating this person's death to some sort of religious status. Because after all, when we think of martyrs, that's who we think of. Joan of Arc, Jesus, and so on. So, the choices then that reporters and editors are ma make is how we tell the story and the words that we use. What peace journalism is not, it is not open advocacy for peace. So we're not saying there must be peace, but we are leading discussions about peace. Peace journalism is, does not ignore bad news, does not ignore news that will make people angry does not ignore the unpleasant. These things are news and they must be reported. Terrorist attacks, crime sprees, um, you know, violence that, uh, that broke out during the protests, they have to be reported. So a peace journalist doesn't ask if the, that we should report them, but how we should report them, what frames we should use, what language we should use, and so on. Uh, Jake Lynch, a uh, professor at the University of Sydney and one of the founders of peace journalism says that peace journalism is reporting that helps the public consider nonviolent responses to conflict. And that's another definition that I like a great deal. So the elements of peace journalism include framing, giving a voice to peacemakers, giving a voice to the voiceless instead of just reporting for and about elites. Uh, word choice, avoiding inflammatory language, um, rejecting us versus them narratives. So this is a key, a key I think, when we talk about uh, these narratives related to uh, covering protest movements. Because inevitably, uh, regardless of which partisan media outlet you're consuming, you're going to be split into camps. So uh, one side being the protesters, Black Lives Matter movement, and so on. The other side being police, authorities, and so on. So the media have a tendency, when covering lots of different kinds of stories, to split people into two camps. What peace jur journalism would say is instead of splitting people into groups, instead looking to build bridges between these groups. So it's not just police on one side and protesters on the other. In fact, some of the goals, some of the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement, it can be said, are shared by both, by, by, by all the players. 
in this conflict. And finally, peace journalism uh, seeks context. So we're really good, and, and I, I studied this and wrote about it in my book um, for the um, Ferguson protests about the uh, Michael Brown killing. And the media there uh, did a pretty decent job of covering the actual protests, what I call play-by-play -play coverage of the protests, but didn't provide very much context. So the media acted as though it was some sort of surprise that something like this would happen in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, whereas had they been reporting about this all along and providing more context, it should, come, should have come as a surprise to no one that a marginalized community like Ferguson chose to, uh, chose to strike out in the way that they did. So, so context is, is really important, I think, for peace journalism and for reporting incidents such as these. So how can these peace journalism principles apply specifically to covering civic unrest? So let me give you a few of my ideas. So number one, to report on them fairly, respectfully, and with empathy. To not stereotype about all violent police officers and not to stereotype about all violent protesters, but to look for the humanity in both sides. Secondly, to report about the invisible causes and effects of the unrest. So we can see a few smash windows or a burnt car or that traffic is shut down because people are protesting. But, but what are the reasons behind this? And I, I will say, I don't have any study data to prove this, but I will say that I, I believe that, that something changed with the coverage of the George Floyd protests. I, I, I've heard more, seen more, read more about systemic racism than I ever have, have during the coverage uh, of the past um, protests. So you can ask me about that and uh, correct me if you disagree in a few moments. I think the journalists should use precise and objective language. So it matters what we're calling the people who are protesting. It matters the way that we characterize, characterize the violence. So was Minneapolis on fire? Ridiculous, right? So, a, so the, the, the violence associated with the protests in Minneapolis was confined to a couple of small areas, right? Minneapolis was not on fire. 99% of Minneapolis was untouched by the protests, right? So was Kansas City burning? <clears throat> Certainly not. A few cars on the plaza were burning and some windows were broken out. But to say that Kansas City is burning is simply inaccurate. And so I, I think, you know, this goes back to the importance of accuracy in everything that we do. Number four, report proactively to facilitate dialogues before violence occurs. So before Ferguson, before the protests in Ferguson, why wasn't there more coverage of the marginalization of Ferguson and, and the systemic discrimination that created Ferguson? Why weren't there why didn't the press cover at greater length the systemic racism uh, and the, the, the problems in policing that led to uh, the protests, uh, the recent protests? So I think one thing that any good journalist or peace journalist can do is to facilitate this dialogue, to bring people together and to lead these discussions. And instead of acting surprised when violence occurs. To report number five, counter narratives that provide a different perspective on the protesters, the police, and the community. So we know what the narratives are of the protesters. They're angry, they're violent. We know what the narrative is of the police. They're brutal, they're violent. And we know what the narrative is of the community, that this is something maybe that only the black community cares about. Well, certainly 
we saw differently during the Kansas City protests. To report number six with reconciliation in mind. So it's not journal, a journalist's job, a peace journalist's job to heal society. But what a peace journalist can do is to lend, uh, lend a platform to those voices who are talking about reconciliation, who are talking about solutions. So what needs to happen for us to begin healing as a society? So it's easy as a journalist to report the episode. It's much harder to report the context behind the episode and to report what the next steps, what we can do to begin reconciliation and healing as a society. And finally, to give voice to peacemakers on all sides during and after the unrest. So an example I cited in my blog was the moving viral video of a Minneapolis rapper named Killer Mike. Uh, very badly named, but his message was uh, very interesting, very inspiring, and I think the kind of voices that um, that everyone in the media, that everyone in the public uh, needs to hear uh, more of. So before I get to the questions then, um, what I would say is this. Um, it's my hope that someday media consumers will demand more from their media outlets, including abandoning reflexively partisan narratives of everything from COVID-19 to these protests. It's my hope that when this happens, media outlets consider these suggestions from peace journalism that can improve their reporting and their service to the public. So at this point I've left lots and lots of time for questions and discussions, and I'd like to begin that. Um, so, Lewis, I am uh, ready for the first question. Well, we've got three so far, uh, Steve. Um, one is uh, from our audience. Uh, why is so much news in the U.S. bifurcated uh, in such a way that there are typically only two ways in which it is framed. In this case, conservative versus uh, liberal. Pick an issue in the news. Um, well, pick an issue and the news usually gives you only two views, often with the speaker presenting just those two outlooks. Your thoughts? Right, well, I mean, this is something that uh, media researchers who, a lot, who are a lot smarter than I am have spent a long time researching. Certainly they'll, they'll tell you that one of the drivers of this is, um, is cable news. And, and particularly uh, the way that, that audiences have been fractured by both cable news and by um, the internet. So think back to a bucolic time 40 years ago, um, birds chirping overhead, and, night, and America getting their nightly news from Uncle Walter Cronkite and his peers. So, you know, back in those days, uh, when you had just a few choices and your local newspaper, um, there was really no choice for those outlets but to play it down the middle. Well, along came cable TV, along came the internet, and, and they decided that since there are not five outlets, but 5,000 outlets, that the way that they can make their money is to narrow cast, to speak to a smaller portion of the audience. So this has led to this and the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine, um, have led, uh, which was years ago, uh, have led to this, these sort of media silos, conservative and liberal media silos, um, as a way to, to grab and to keep a loyal audience uh, and as a way to keep the lights on, to keep paying the bills and to, uh, to make some money. So I think that, that those are some of the drivers behind uh, these two media narratives. And I think the politicians uh, have done nothing but fuel uh, this narrow casting, right? Uh, 
uh, by favoring networks on one side or the other. Uh, certainly the relationship between Fox and President Trump has been well documented. I won't go into that. Um, but I think those are a couple of, a couple of the reasons why we see this uh, polarized media environment. Here's another that I, I think um, really draws on your uh, travels and expertise. How does the sort of media dynamic uh, you've described compare to media dynamics in other democratic countries with large populations? Well, um, I, I, I'm, so I'm thinking of the, of the uh, large democratic countries in which I've traveled, and, and actually that, that's not a very large number. So I think of India, for example, um, and an Indian media environment that is, um, in my, not that I have expertise about Indian media, but in my limited knowledge of it, uh, even more polarized, even uh, worse in that respect than the U.S. media. Um, portraying, for example, uh, Kashmiris as terrorists, you know, and in, uh, literally an entire state full of, of uh, terrorists. Um, so so I, I think the media there is very inflammatory. Um, I did some project work on reporting Syrian refugees in um, Germany and Austria. Um, so I, I think the media there uh, tend to play it more down the middle than the media here. So although there are partisan media outlets, I think they're, they're the, the larger institutional outlets uh, tend to play it a little more down the middle there. Uh, Turkey. So I also did a reporting Syrian refugees project in Turkey. Uh, the Turkish media is very right-leaning. Um, Erdogan, uh, the prime minister, um, has, as you're probably aware, um, gone to great lengths to silence critics, both political and media critics. Uh, and I think that that's manifested in the, uh, in the media. And uh, any more, the, the media in Turkey very much resemble the media in uh, one-party states like North Korea or Cuba. Here's another question. Are there any U.S. media sources that are more likely to give even-handed coverage and who should we read or listen to? So um, it's a big question. Let, let me say, first of all, that this question touches on something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is media literacy. And in fact, Lewis and I are working on a media literacy project here in Kansas City for which I got a State Department alumni grant. And so one of our messages when, when we teach media literacy to middle schoolers, high schools, high schoolers, junior college, uh, community college, and four-year college students later in September is to break out of your media bubble, uh, to recognize the media that you consume and whatever that media is to seek media outside of that bubble. So, so what you should watch and listen to and read is this. If you're a conservative, you should read the New York Times. You should watch CNN. You should read the Washington Post. If you are a liberal, you should watch Fox News. You should read the Wall Street Journal. You should look at the Breitbart website, all right? I myself make a weekly practice several times a week of watching um, outside of my bubble. And this viewing outside of the bubble for me uh, appears in the form of the Sean Hannity program. Now, um, I, the, my viewing of Hannity frequently in involves flying objects and obscenities, but nonetheless, it's important for me to practice what I, pe what I preach and to consume this media that's outside of my bubble. So that's my best advice to anyone, is to try to consume as broad a spectrum of media as possible. Um, and, and I think in this way, 
that we can all make ourselves better informed. Okay, here's another question. Um, as there are many teaching faculty from diverse disciplines in attendance today, uh, I wanted to see if you could say something about adapting the principles and practices, practices of peace journalism to the classroom. I've heard students express concern and skepticism about partisan teaching and faculty pushing agendas, and it strikes me that there are useful strategies to be drawn from your work. Interesting. May, 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 I, may I call out that person? And, and because obviously you have some ideas about what this might look like in your discipline. W would, you mind, uh, would you mind sharing those with us? Uh, sure. Hi, Steve. It's Dawn. Oh, hi, uh, Dawn. So, well, I, I teach philosophy. And um, something I hear frequently from my students, they really appreciate that I focus heavily on teaching them how to think critically rather than what to think. And they, they really like that because they feel that a lot of what they experience of people trying to teach them what to think. Um, and, you know, in, in logic and critical thinking, we spend a lot of time on recognizing rhetoric and fallacies. So things that you were saying about word choice being important and, um, and the way that something's being presented and how it might be attempting um, to influence the way that we think and the decisions we make, um, you know, really resonates with me. So I just thought that might be useful, um, you know, to think about from a teaching perspective. And I know I have colleagues on here from other disciplines. So without a specific discipline in mind, but just, you know, how we can utilize these strategies in the classroom to make our students feel more comfortable and, you know, and promote really, critical thinking. That, thank you, Don. And that's really interesting. And to, and to be completely candid with you, something that I hadn't really thought of before, but I, you know, I think you make an excellent point. You know what, uh, just off the top of my head, what one of the tools that we use a lot in media studies and in, con in peace journalism particularly, is media content analysis. Where we'll, we'll produce uh, something that looks like a rubric, an evaluation tool, and, and we can use this as a way to evaluate stories to see if they're peace journalism. Well, I'm wondering if you and your students in any discipline couldn't develop a similar tool uh, to, to look for uh, to look for, say, uh, bias in um, presentations about rhetoric, a uh, bias in uh, the classroom. You know, I, I would, if it's a, if, if in your classroom it's a 600 pound gorilla, tell the students, you know, like, so, so you've accused me of being, uh, of, of proposing a liberal agenda. You know, let's break that down. What does a liberal agenda look like? What does it sound like? Uh, and then uh, listen to today's presentation and you tell me, use your tool and evaluate it. So, so maybe, maybe uh, take the opportunity to have them critically think about what this is. Cause it's easy to say this is biased, but what does that really look like? Um, so yeah, that's a great idea, Don, thank you. I, I'm gonna think about that myself because I also teach peace studies and it's extremely hard to teach peace studies and not be characterized and ridiculed uh, by some students at least as a bleeding heart liberal. Here's so another, I'll think about that myself. Thank you, Don. Here's another question. How can we ever become objective if we continue to label people, ideas, etc.? Well, it, it, if by we you mean journalists, um, I've always believed, and actually, Lewis, I'd like your opinion on this too. I've always believed that objectivity in journalism is an ideal, that it's absolutely unobtainable. So uh, the idea being that as journalists, we are objective if we report only the facts, only the news, and completely eliminate our our influences and biases from the news that we cover. But I don't believe this to be possible. Do you, Lewis? Um, you're right. Objectivity is a goal and um, it is uh, wholly unachievable. Um, what we strive for instead is uh, balance um, mm -hmm. and uh, context, uh, as well as um, uh, giving people 
uh, information that involves all sides. That's the way it should be done. Um, yes. Now, everything is being really uh, changed by uh, journalism and journalists being encouraged to become good storytellers. And in, in telling a story, um, it is um, uh, important to uh, really frame it so that you have good guys and bad guys. You have good situations and bad situations. Us versus them. Us versus them, exactly. Um, and, and that's part of the problem. But uh, journalism also is being pushed, um, as television has been all along, uh, for audience. With um, newspapers, magazines, um, uh, internet uh, publishing, now um, really dependent um, and relying on the audience from the internet. It gives um, media companies and executives um, a direct line to how well a story is uh, being received or a picture is being received. That feedback um, really, again, following the television model, simply says, deliver more of that. We want more of that. And so, we see all of the media bending toward um, these biases that really frame the story of whether it's um, positive or negative. Right, and and um, I and to further address the question, um, I, I think on the road to being more objective, maybe the first step is to recognize our own biases, stereotypes about anything or anyone and to to you know act accordingly to to understand where we're coming from and to you know temper our work accordingly um so i so i i mean the answer is that the there's no way to ever have media that aren't uh, that are completely unbiased um I, I think the best we can do is to recognize those biases, to practice some of these peace journalism principles, and that as news consumers, to break out of our bubble, to inform ourselves and be better consumers of media so that we can recognize bias when we see it in the reporting that we consume. Here's another question. Um, so it sounds like we need to get out of our deeply rooted biases and stereotypes to embrace non-biased peaceful engagement. That's the question. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with that sentiment. Um, I mean, you've heard what I think about the media. Um, I've had lots of those who have been trained in peace journalism say, you know, I, there are some ideas here, I think, that I want to use in my own personal life to, you know, to understand my own biases and to be more careful about the language that I use um, and to, you know, to look to not always oversimplify and divide people into groups, into us versus them. Um, so I do think there's some some wisdom in peace journalism that that's certainly applicable outside the realm of journalism. Okay. Um, the question uh, also is that 80% um, of the news media in the United States or, or US, 80% um, of US journalists are white. Would, a more, would more diversity in journalism help provide more context and uh, less us versus them um, in protests, unrest, and other situations? Yes, 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 yes. The fact is that our newsrooms don't reflect the societies that we report about. And without that diversity in the newsroom, how can we be expected to provide the context that we need to accurately reflect what's going on in a given community? Um, Lewis, I hate to keep throwing these to you, but uh, you know, this is a subject for which Lewis has worked tire tirelessly for um, 
for many years. And so would you like to expand on that a little bit and talk about the importance of diversity in newsrooms? Sure, um, that'll be part of the topic that I'll take on uh, on um, uh, the 21st of this month. Hey, that's a little plug, by the way. That's our next uh, peace building presentation, the 21st. Uh, Lewis will plug it more later, but go on ahead, Lewis. Sure, the, um, an effort was made by um, uh, newspapers uh, back in 1978, if you can believe, um, to uh, have jobs in journalism be at parity with the population by the year 2000. Well, the year 2000 seemed a long way off. Um, only uh, fewer than 4% of all newsroom jobs in 1978 were held by journalists of color. They thought that by uh, the year 2000, that they could certainly achieve 25% um, of the jobs in newsrooms being held by journalists of color so that there would be parity with the population. Part of the problem was that the um, diversity in the population increased so that we're now more at more than 33%, but the efforts toward uh, getting uh, newsrooms to become more diverse uh, in, and include more women, um, really stagnated uh, so that by the 1990s, late 1990s, fewer than 11% of journalism jobs were held by people of color. And so what did um, news organizations do that really value deadlines? They moved the deadline back to 2025. But here at 2025, um, we're still faced with more than 80% of all journalism, journalism jobs in newsrooms being held um, by people who are white. And the reporting that was being done for the news um, uh, ASNE, the American uh, Society of News Editors, um, on diversity in the media, uh, news organizations just stopped reporting on it. So. Um, it's kind of like uh, what I found in Cuba. They said, oh, there's no racism in Cuba. Well, well, how do you get that there's no racism in Cuba when the population is just as diverse as, as in the United States? Well, we don't keep data on it. And so that's why um, we're, we're facing this, this problem. There's, there's not data because of the data that can be reported is so bad. So Lewis, if we don't, if we don't test for COVID and count the COVID deaths, or COVID cases, then they don't exist, right? Exactly. That's uh, um, what uh, NPR is reporting today on Bob Woodward's um, new book that uh, Trump uh, decided that he was going to um, uh, downplay uh, the COVID virus from the start because he saw that the public would become too hysterical. Now, that only means that uh, the public wasn't alert to what was coming and um, we're faced with more than 185,000 deaths in this country and, and so many millions who've been um, uh, exposed. So Lewis, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take a short question that caught my attention. This is from, uh, from uh, my colleague and friend, Jeanette Jesperson, who says, why could, who asks, why consume media outside our bubble if it just makes us mad? Jeanette. So why does it, I'm gonna ask you and then I'll, I'll give you my answer. So why does it, why does it make you mad? Why, 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 why can't you watch it with a glass of wine and a chill pill and you know. Well, See, you don't drink, I'm sorry, so no wine, but you're you know what I'm saying. You said you throw things at the TV when you're watching Sean Hannity. So I throw I, the question back to you. You're the one getting mad. I am, I am, um, but, but, but I hope that I'm also listening closely because I think it's really important to know what, what we're hearing from our friends and neighbors because after all, we are in Kansas and Missouri. So, so Kansas City may be a bit of, parts of Kansas City at least are an island of blue in a sea of red, right? So you know, why do our friends and neighbors, as a, as a, you know, as a liberal, I would ask, why do our friends and neighbors think this way? So, so 
I think just think that it's crucial to understand that. Um, and for me, because I'm not particularly mature, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, may, I may use some inappropriate language, but more than anything, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and, and, and thinking about, okay, well, wh what's this message and why is the message being framed this way? And, and why are some people thinking that way? So your idea is then you can more effectively talk to these friends, neighbors, relatives. Yeah, well, be, because after all, we, we have to all live together, right? So, you know, I want to know where they're coming from. I, I, by the way, I'm reading the greatest book, and I should have brought it in. It, it's, it's something like, how it has elephant in the title. I'll send it out to all of you. But it, it's, it talks about the way that conservative media, that conser the conservative political movement uh, over the last 20 or 30 years has framed various subjects. And it, 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 and it talks about, one of the things it talks about is how um, to, to have a better conversation across these political boundaries to use the language that they're using. So for example, and this one just jumped off the page at me. So this was written before the George Floyd protests. And it said, if you're talking about civil rights protesters, don't talk about, don't frame it in terms of rights. Frame it instead in terms of freedoms. So the, the, the conservative movement talks a lot about freedoms and frames lots of their arguments about freedoms. So what you can say about discrimination then would be that discrimination is preventing is preventing those who are discriminated against from living freely, from experiencing freedom. And so when you frame it in that way, all of a sudden you're, you're hitting them where they live. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think understanding the vocabulary and the framing from all sides um, is you know, increasingly essential. Uh, as a consumer of media and as someone participating in the political life of the country. Thank you, Jeanette. Let's uh, take one last question. Um, yes, sir. We're right up on uh, three o'clock. Uh, aside from improving the diversity in newsrooms, is there anything we can do to encourage our news sources to provide more balanced reporting? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, well, one way that we as news consumers vote is with our clickers, right? So, um, you know, what, one something that you can do is to, you know, consume the media that you consider, you know, the most responsible. Um, so I, the, the, the way that I vote in consuming the media I consume is I vote by looking at the BBC website, for example, um, which I think does a decent job of playing it down the middle. Um, so I think that that's one way that, that we do that. Um, I think that it's important that we communicate. I, I mean, journalists aren't journalism organizations. They are us. They are in our community. And I think it's important for us to let our journalism friends, journalist friends and neighbors know when we appreciate their reporting. And I think it's important to let them know as well uh, when they're wrong, when they took an incorrect angle, uh, when they omitted important facts, and when they were needlessly biased. So communication, building those bridges, something that peace journalism talks about is something that I think we can do as media consumers as well. Well, that's great. Um, I want to thank everyone who's participated in uh, today's um, discussion on peace building. Um, we'll continue this uh, dialogue, um, as it says, uh, September, October, November, so three months of, of work on, on this, and we hope to uh, leave you with new tools um, 
for uh, becoming better peace builders. Thank you. By the way, the name of that book is The Elephant in, uh, oh, where'd it go? The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. So that's the name of the book. So check it out. Thank you for being here. Take care, everyone.